Welcome to the Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. My name is Dr. Adriana Popescu. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and leader in the field of mental health, energy psychology, addiction, trauma, and empowerment. In this podcast, we will be exploring mental health from a variety of perspectives, from the spiritual to the shamanic and beyond. What if mental illness isn't everything we think it is? What if everything we see as a pathology is actually a possibility? What else is possible with mental health? Hi everyone, Dr. Adriana Popescu here with you today again for another episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. With me today is my beautiful guest, Dr. Glenna Rice. She is a physical therapist certified in access consciousness and joy of business, conscious parenting, and is the creator of EMT energetic manual therapy. Glenna is also a multi-Amazon best-selling co-author, and she's been working with dancers, athletes, children, and anyone who's asking for something greater with their body and lives for over 25 years. She's created a worldwide business from the ground up through individual clients, group workshops, classes, and speaking. Welcome, Glenna. Hi, Adriana. So excited to be here. You make me sound really cool with that. my bio. Thank you. I'm well, really you know excited. what? You actually are really cool. I know you personally, and I've actually worked with you both collaboratively as you know professionals working with clients and personally, and you've worked on me and my body. So I love that um, we have so much we can talk about in terms of, you know, this amazing work that so many people don't know about, which is why I'm doing this podcast, which really is to educate people on alternative perspectives on health, well-being, mental health in particular, and um, how we can go beyond the traditional paradigm that Western medicine and psychology offers us to really create wholeness and wellness. So first, I always like to ask all my guests, how did you come to do the work that you do? Mm. We have to go way back to when I chose to be a physical therapist back in undergrad, which goes like 30 years ago. Um, But I became a physical therapist, worked with children for quite a few years, and then I was introduced to um, myofascial release therapy. I moved, decided I wanted to change who I was working with, work more with dancers and sports medicine, which was always kind of my plan when I first became a physical therapist. Took this amazing workshop that really opened my eyes to what else is possible, like energetically with bodies, how bodies can change. Just I had never um, experienced the the possibilities I'd seen with this work and started a practice in that almost immediately. And very quickly after that, I started becoming more, let's say in the question is what we talk about with access consciousness, but we're in the question of what was possible. Started asking more questions about what I wanted my business to be and found an access consciousness workshop, which included, you know, these questions to change everything in your life, but also included the body in the work. And everything started changing. What I was seeing with patients exponentialized the changes I would see with their bodies. You know, I'd have an ankle problem that would get better in a couple days, which might've taken me a week or two before. I'd always already gotten quite, everything had been really different with the myofascial work that I'd done. Um, but now it was like, I'd have like half an hour left in my session. Like, what do I do now? They're already better. <laughs> So things started changing dramatically. So it was, it was, you know, kind of a process over years. But once I added consciousness to the work, you know, looking at things from a totally different perspective, um, not just this physical, the physical body, but everything that was going on in their lives and how sometimes you could change something so bizarre, like a relationship and their body would change. Um, I started, you know, everything started to grow. Wow. Yeah. There's so much I want to respond to and everything yeah, you yeah, just yeah. said. And one is, I think you, what you alluded to, which is this separation in our kind of Western medical paradigm, um, we separate the mind and the body and even the spirit, right? Like those are different things and you go to a different practitioner for each one of them. Whereas let's say with some of the Eastern medicines, um, like traditional Chinese medicine or Indian medicine, it's all it's all connected. You know, you don't go to a different type of doctor for a different issue. So can you say more about that fragmentation of the paradigm that we're in and how you are working differently with that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And the, the Western medicine has really 
split all of these practices up. And then the way our professions all work, you have rules and regulations that you can't get past. Like I can't do mental health officially, even though those things can all be up in my practice because I'm not trained in that, even though, you know, years of schooling and psych I took a lot of psychology classes to get my degree, but that's still not where I can go. And like, you can't go below the head. You can't touch the body in your practice. Um, it's crazy. I mean, they did it even with the physical therapist. It's like the doctors do the medicine part and the physical therapist do the body part. Or even with occupational therapists, they do the hands and we do the rest of the body. It's very strange because the body doesn't exist that way. Our beings don't exist that way. We don't exist in these separate realms. You know, and you can get past it a bit by collaborating with other practitioners if your patients are seeing other practitioners. So it's... It, it, really limits, it's a huge limitation to what is possible with how we can help people and create changes in their lives and how they can choose greater. Yeah, say more about that. You know, you talked a lot about um, choice and creation, and I don't think most people even realize that they have choice when it comes to their bodies, right? Like, this is what yeah. I was born with. This is what genetically I inherited from my family and my family has all these problems. So therefore I'm going to have all these problems. Can you talk a little bit about your take on that, which is a little bit different? It's really different. I mean, you always have choice. We always have choice. We can choose different and things change. Choice creates your reality. It creates your body. When you change your point of view and you choose different things in your body and your life start to change. Um, one of the things that can be a really big limitation or something that will stick people is once they get a diagnosis, they lose choice. I mean, they can be so aware, like our bodies have this ability um, to give us information around, uh, from the world around us. We've all felt it. We all like know when someone walks into a room, even if our back is to them, we've sensed that someone just walked in a room. Our body gives us that information and it's so much bigger than that. But you get this diagnosis, once you get, I don't know, fibromyalgia, there's a real common one that I see a lot in my practice, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. Um, they're kind of these blanket diagnosis because enough box for, boxes were checked. They then have to almost prove that they have it, even if it's, and I'm not saying that they're faking it. And that's where it can get really weird with people is like, well, I'm not faking it. I have all these symptoms. It's like, yeah. You do, but what are they? What is that actually, what is your body actually telling you with each one of those symptoms? And the choice to change that point of view can just decrease someone's pain in a visit. They have choice. Sometimes it's our limitations and the points of views with fixed, like I have this thing and I have the th this thing that I have is the, you know, most, the worst one the doctors have ever even seen. You know, they're so proud of what they have. What if and if I can change that to look at like this other possibility where you can be cha creating change by choosing, cr creating a change for a greater body to start to create with your body, it's amazing what that choice will start to create for people. Does well, that make sense? That yeah, was a lot of totally. I mean, the thing I thought of when you were talking was how the, the research that they've done with people who get diagnoses, like it actually changes. They've done MRI studies where they look at the brain and they can see changes in the brain that happen once a person gets that label or diagnosis. And this is true for physical issues, mental health issues, whatever. They can see that. And not only that, but those studies where they um, take people who've given, been given a cancer diagnosis and the doctor says, well, you only have six months to live, they will, the people who agree with that point of view, who align and agree with that point of view will die within six months because that's what they, was, they were told and that's what their body is now carrying out. I think people don't understand that connection between your point of view really does create what your body does. Yeah, it creates the reality with your body. I mean, your body's creating all the time, which people kind of get, our bodies are just like this fixed thing. They look this way, they get a little bit older, but literally our bones are all new in three months. Like this, every cell that you have right now in your skeletal, musculoskeletal system is gonna be new in a few months. They'll, like you're a brand new baby. Your bones are only like a three month old baby all the time. They're always turning over your skin's like that, but we keep creating their bodies like they don't have this ability to change quickly. And that's where the choice comes in really. When you choose to see, have a different point of view and a not a fixed point of view, you can start changing those things. Cause if someone has a point of view and we've met them get the, the cancer diagnosis. Um, 
and they're like, oh, I have six months to live. And someone says, that's not going to happen. That's not my point of view. I'm going to change that. And that's choice. And then you start seeing a different possibility. And you get people that are like, you know, five years past and say, yeah, the doctor said I was only lived six months. That was 10 years ago. That was a choice they made. Yeah. So how do you get people to choice? Well, people don't know that they have Right. People don't realize that they have that choice. And part of our work is to show them that they do, like by asking them the questions, like what else is possible here? And what other choices do you actually have that you haven't acknowledged before? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it is that simple. That's the weirdest thing about the work we do is that it's so easy, like really asking a question, well, what else is possible you've never considered with this diagnosis with your body? And that question alone will start to change their point of view because you start to see other possibilities that you can choose that you didn't have that you didn't even know were available to choose your choice was limited before now you have more choice now i want to ask you You a little bit oh so go ahead no go ahead no this is going to i work with you know a physical therapist we do gait training we teach people how to walk it's a big part of our you know what we do in the world and i've had people that you know maybe had a cerebral palsy for years, they're in their 30s or 40s, and just saying, okay, what else is possible with your body? What if you gave your body permission to start to walk the way it wanted to? After I've like uncreated or changed their points of views about everything all the doctors and physical therapists have told them for 30 years, especially when they were little kids, and dramatic changes in how long their steps are, how much their limp is, to the point they're just like, oh my God, I never knew this was possible. And that was just from just the question of what would it take for you to give your body permission to walk the way it would like to. Not a lot of body work in that. That was just an example of people changing their point of view. Super cool. So now tell us a little bit about the work that you've done with people with mental health and addiction issues. There was a time when you were working actually in a drug and alcohol rehab and got to work with a lot of folks who had the mental health side dominant with things. What did you notice about that? What did you notice with their bodies? What were you doing with them? Hmm. I, it was great. I was a consultant for, they had a pain, the, the program I was working with had a pain management program. So most of the patients that I was seeing were um, a, opioid addictions from chronic pain for years and you know, really difficult getting the withdrawal time period is quite intense with those drugs to get off of them. Um, and their pain is coming back. And that, that's their trigger to use and to, so I, to, to find, show them ways to decrease their pain so they could stay sober or stay off the meds um, was the basis of my work. But I used really, you know, this energetic manual therapy, so the myofascial release work, worked with the fascial system a lot with their old scars or injuries, whatever. That was opening the tissue and the space up so it wasn't as dense from these old injuries. Um, I also did... What, what we call the bars, access bars, which are points on the head that you touch gently. It's a relaxation technique. It does have a study out there um, that shows that it decreases anxiety and stress and suicidal ideation. Um, and I would just be there with that, giving him that technique or some other energetic processes. Um, they would get up and say they felt the best they'd ever felt in their life sometimes right after these processes. I got quite popular because then they would tell the people in the, in the, um, <laughs> in the rehab what, what it was like and they'd all want sessions with me also, but they, didn't, they weren't in the pain program because they weren't in there for, um, for chronic pain issues along with the rehab. So, there was that and then giving them like helping them what they've been doing and they were using something you know, with their sub there's a new diagnosis the way we call it to speak about it i'm sorry i blanked but the substance that they were using and the wrongness they had in a lot of the programs they'd done previously and like i remember saying to one lady what if nothing you've ever done was wrong and she stopped in her tracks and like no one had ever said that to her and that was really all I spoke to her about in that session. And I changed her life. I've known her for years since and um, followed her for many years. And she saw me after, she, you know, an outpatient, followed me, her an outpatient. And that changed her life. 
because there's such a wrongness that's associated with addiction. And that wrongness is fixed. I don't know, you could speak quite a bit to, about that also. Like, what have you seen with, with, with your patients and clients when they can change how wrong they are perceive themselves around what they've done? Well, created. Yeah, so much, right? I mean, I just, you know, recently in another podcast episode interviewed Marilyn Bradford, who also does this type of work. And she talks about how with addiction, the primary addiction is actually to self-judgment and that the other, uh, you know, substances, behaviors, whatever are really secondary. And if you get the person to look at how they're judging themselves and all the shame that that creates and you help them to, start shifting the way they're seeing themselves and even their bodies, right? And you start um, offering them a different possibility, everything changes, right? And the other thing that I think is really interesting, let's talk about this for a moment, is how judgment, um, our points of view, our judgments actually get locked into our bodies. That was a real eye-opener for me years ago when I first, you know, took some access classes and, and heard that and thought, my God, that would explain so much of like, why I have so many, I've, I've always struggled with, you know, different health things and stuff with my body and my body has been rigid and tight and kind of like a suit of armor. And it totally makes sense that if I have this belief system that I need to protect myself, that I'm not safe in the world, then of course my body then has to create a suit of armor for me to live in. Like our points of view get locked into our bodies. It's fascinating. And what I find that that also does is it locks like the energy that we be, the being that we are out of our bodies, right? So we are, don't have the communion or the connection and we can't, or the creation with our bodies. It's actually possible. And healing, if your body's trying to heal from something or change something and you're not present with it, and you talk that people say, you know, be present with your body, but what is that? You know, if you're not present with it, it's much harder, I found, you know, and this is working thousands of people, it's much, much harder to create those changes when you're not present with your body. And any judgment or point of view about our body solidifies, the judgments solidify. They solidify our body and it's harder to be present with it. So a lot of my sessions are just start out with what would it take for you to be a thousand times more aware of the space between the molecules of your body to bring the being in the in into the spaces of the body so they're present with me during a session and that exponentializes how much change is possible you can feel the body just go hi mm -hmm. hi you've been avoiding me for a long time you know and it's not just what you're talking about with protection there's also you know teenagers that don't like their body because they don't look right you know they're not skinny enough eating disorders, the depression that can, you know, happen with people that are really upset with how their body is looking. And then they separate from their body. And there's a sadness that can be created with that because our body actually would probably like us around since we're creating together. All, there's so many different ways we can start. We can go into how the body can affect mental health. Well, yes. And, and the other way around, right? Um, one of the things that I work a lot with is trauma and I know that you do too, right? Can you tell us a little bit about what you've discovered with folks both in any realm really, like being present with their bodies and so much more, but what, what have you noticed about people who've experienced trauma, whether it's physical trauma to the body or you know, sexual, emotional, psychological kinds of trauma? Yeah, I, well, they go together. I mean, mostly I would be seeing the physical trauma like car accidents, abuse, um, just injuries to the body. And any kind of an injury to the body can create trauma. Um, but there's a huge piece in there of the emotional trauma that goes with each one of those events. And it's really interesting over the years to see someone that had a surgery. Now there's trauma in surgeries. Sometimes there's a lot of, I've worked with a lot of women that have had C-sections and those, those, especially the emergency C-sections can create intense trauma. They're terrified. You know, in the event, you know, your baby's going to die. We have to cut your stomach open. We're going to take the baby out. They may have had a whole birth plan that was, you know, going to be a water birth with dolphins and rivers. I don't know, but they, everything is traumatic about it. And those kind of surgeries, not just C-sections, but any of the surgeries that have a lot of trauma, the scarring and density and pain is much more than I see in something that's more elective or where the body's more congruent 
with the requirement to have the surgery, which is not being forced on people. Um, and they have, it's the, and if I don't look at and work with the emotional trauma, it's really hard to free up the bodies. They're, they're just tied up together. So if I don't have people start freeing up, you know, their points of views about the trauma and, and what I had to describe it, it's like, they don't want to, the body had the trauma. They don't want to know about it. The body solidifies to keep them out, keep their awareness out, to not move that part of the body. Like people that have whiplash injuries and car accidents. Like it's not that their, their head is healed. It's 10 years later, the body is healed, but there's still all this pain restriction and all these things going on. And sometimes I, if I can just get them to um, release some of the points of views about, I thought I was going to die during the trauma, their neck will go. Yes. It's a really miraculous thing. And, and not Beautiful. just, not just the work that, you know, we do with access, but all kinds of somatic therapies, you know, somatic experiencing and sensory motor therapy and all these different modalities that work exactly what they're working non-verbally to essentially clear trauma from the body, including all that emotional stuff. I mean, especially when we're children and we have no concept of how to like deal with like the traumatic things that happen psychologically, emotionally, where does it go? Of course it gets locked in the body. And then the body, it's almost like a defense mechanism. It goes, it, we somaticize it, it goes in the body and we forget about it until Maybe years later, it gets activated somehow. You know, for me, it, I remember with car accidents, I had a car accident 20 years after the original one. And all of that, I started crying and all this emotion came up from the original accident that I didn't even know was there. Yeah. And and it's interesting how people are do, working so hard. Like it's it's a lot of work to keep you from the awareness of the things in your life and the trauma and how once the awareness is there, like it's never as bad as they think it's going to be. What I found, it's never as bad as they think it's going to be. They spend their whole lives avoiding this thing and their body contributes to that. Your body helps you avoid that awareness. And when they actually have it, it's like, oh, it's not as, I mean, the, the amount of energy for 30 years, 40 years, some people have held on to things and their bodies have solidified. And now they have joint degeneration and all these things going on from something that is not nearly as traumatic, like the, the, the recalling it isn't as traumatic as they decided it's gonna be. Right. right. And it is hard to get there. I mean, you will do everything you can to avoid that. Well, yeah, including a lifetime of using drugs, alcohol and other behaviors to like, you know, suppress it. And it's true. And it's, and it is that point of view. It's like, I, I see that so often it comes up, you know, at the rehab where I work, where clients are like, oh, I can't go there. I, if I even go there, I know it, it almost like if I start crying, it'll never stop or it'll kill me to even look at that. But that's such an old point of view. That might even be a child's point of view. Yeah, sure. As a child, it was overwhelming, scary, whatever you thought you couldn't deal with it. But now if you actually would be willing to look at it, you might find that it isn't quite as horrific as you thought, or at the very least, now you have support, you have tools, you have people who can actually, you know, be there with you as you go through this process of healing and you're not alone. So there's just so much we can offer our clients when we're willing to include the body in it. Yeah. Yeah. I find that um, in really traumatic events where people have a point of view, they might die just talking to the body and you know you didn't die that you survived that you thrived past it and it's empowering them to what's actually true because they can be stuck in that kind of death mode for a long time and i just kind of in a that fight and flight forever this kind of terror that they're always about to die and they didn't and something sometimes just as simple as like can you just Thank your body for getting through that accident, getting through that abuse. Like, look how powerful your body is. Look what it was able to create and start changing this, the victim paradigm that they were effective, all this stuff to this empowerment paradigm that they're actually really powerful beings walking this planet with powerful bodies that were able to survive and thrive beyond these events that are so pivotal in how they're creating their lives now and what's possible. This is really what else is possible. Truly. And then just one last thing I want to say about it, because I know this comes up in your work as well, is that sometimes we're 
carrying not even our own traumas, but other people's traumas and other people's points of view and experiences. You know, and I think about the giving birth thing, right? For that woman who had the C-section, not only is she probably still having her own trauma that got locked in the body, but she probably also has some of the baby's trauma. Can you just say a little bit about the who does it belong to aspect to bodies and emotions and traumas and whatever it is that we're holding in our bodies might not be just ours. Yeah, the who does it belong to? It's like our bodies, like I said, are pick up energy all around us and they pick up other people's energies, good or bad. I mean, there's not really a point of view. Our bodies are just, they do it. They do it. It's not, it's usually never relevant to us, but in situations like that, yes, the baby, the partner, the doctors, the nurses, all of those points of views, even if you're unconscious during the surgery, you can still pick up and recall those other people's just thoughts about it or the, the emotions they had around it, the urgency around the C-section. Um, and if I can help the people uncreate and destroy is what I'm gonna say, it's something that we use in access, but just changing their point of view around it, um, so much more ease can show up. And pain, so you get a C-section scar, you've got so many, you know, you've got all sorts of organs down there in your lower back and there's a lot of low back pain. Um, and low back pain can be stuff you put behind you, you don't wanna look at. That can be an energy of low back pain. And, the, and, you know, with the mental health thing, it can be the sadness, the trauma, the depression, the anxiety, all of these things about an event that you don't want to ever look back on, and it's back there. Mm -hmm. You start opening this up and they look at it. Sometimes I'll just say, hey, just energetically turn around and look at it. And they'll go, oh, wow, my back doesn't hurt. That was weird. How'd you do that? Yeah. It can be <laughs> um, so instantaneously sometimes. Yeah. I've had people that were in car accidents where it wasn't there was people watching the event with the ambulances coming and the terror and the concern of people that saw the accident that they had locked in their, their energy. That energy was locked to them and it was not even their point of view. Because yeah. you know, someone watching the accident going, oh my God, is somebody dead? Right. Are they gonna live? Did you see that? That was so bad and crazy. And all those points of views are with you in this traumatic event. And it can, the thing is it can change. Yes, it can it change. Can change. Yeah, and, and we talk about vicarious traumatization, you know, as mental health professionals, when we witness, you know, somebody else going through a traumatic event, and even it can be on the television or reading a book or anything, you know, we're all so empathic and sensitive that we literally can pick up those thoughts, feelings, emotions, sensations, whatever it is, and we can inadvertently lock it into our bodies when we, you know, take on the point of view of, uh, you know, or misidentify that it's ours. I mean, it's really, this whole field is so rich and fascinating. So much. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one look, I remember there was a young boy I had, was working with that had really bad leg pain, like growing pains. Um, and his, he was a quite a good athlete and his mom brought him in and he had watched, um, what, kind, what, what opened up for him is he had watched a TV show with a really tall person that had to duck through all the doors like a video of some sort and it freaked him out and he never wanted to ever have that. So he was like limiting his growth while his body was growing. Like this is a point of view that he didn't want to get that tall. And it was causing his legs to be like conflicted. <laughs> they had conflicting messages going on. They're growing, you know, he's a young teenager, big growth spurts happening and he's got a point of view. I don't want to be tall and his legs are aching. And we changed that point of view. Like we, I said, I just kind of asked him, ask your body, how tall it actually is going to be. And it was like, you know, nice 5'11", six foot height. It wasn't going to be seven foot eight. He relaxed and they, and he never came in for leg pain again. Hmm. That's so that's a television show story. That's kind of cute, not quite traumatic, but it can be something that simple. It doesn't always have to be trauma guys. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, okay. So lastly, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the energetic manual therapy. This is something you've developed over the years of doing your work. Tell us more about it and, um, and how do you use it with people? Yeah. So it's a lot of what we've been talking about. That's all in that. Um, I studied myofascial release work, cranial sacral, a um, little bit of rolfing for years. And that was what my practice was primarily. And then I added access in. And then it started to create something completely different. There was just a different way I could be aware of bodies, show people what was possible with bodies. There was a beautiful questions I could ask, and we've spoken about those. Um, and over you know the 15 years of seeing people privately, um, 
I kind of got this hit, like, this is a class. This is something you want to do. The bodies were talking to me. And I, I started the class working with some other people in Access, um, doing SE work. And that was kind of the beginning of the EMT class that I have put together. It's a three-day class where you get to learn. And it, you don't have to be a medical professional to do this class. It's open to anybody. Um, where you learn the hands-on techniques working with the fascia, which are incredible, just incredible. And it's not techniques that are difficult. They're just, there's a skills you can learn to start feeling the body, feeling where the densities are and how to invite. And I'm going to say invite because there's, you can't use force with the system. The fascial system doesn't respond to force. It's designed to resist force. So if you're forcing it, it doesn't work very well. So stretching isn't really always the greatest technique when you're wanting to change a tight area in your body. So I'm inviting it with hands on, like touch is such a beautiful component to healing. Um, inviting it to create more space, more flexibility, more possibilities for movement and function in your life. So you're, that's, you know, it's three days of just wondrous, wondrous possibilities for your body and great change. And you get to walk out of the class with skills you can use on your family. And if you're a practitioner, you can start putting it right into your practice right away. Is that oh. enough? How did I go through that? That was, yeah. I mean, there's way more to it, sure. But we can, and we can work with animals too, right? We can also help our furry friends with like healing and all that. We've done some of that work with horses before. And I, I was just blown away by that. I thought it was amazing um, yeah. what we could do. Yeah. 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 We're friends, cats and dogs and even a hamster. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the thing is too, as someone who's received, you know, having been a massage therapist, having been Rolfed, many, many, many times, yes, that, that, that element of force when you're trying to, you know, physically force the body to do something rather than like really being present with it and being in the question and, and more, the more gentle, well, well, what if we looked at it like this? And what if we tried this instead of trying to use force to push something around? It's so much more effective. I know for me and my body, it's been so much more effective. No, and it's been more effective just the results I've gotten over the years with people. And it can be really deep work. It can be very deep work, but the body invites you in. It's like you start to go in deeper where it requires that. So it's not force. It's like this creation with the body. I would say it's like your hands begin to dance with the body and the body is the one that leads. So you have to be an amazing follower. And anyone who's an amazing follower is also aware of where it's going to go. Like if you've ever danced with a partner, you need to know where they're going to go before they go and you have to follow. So your awareness skills of bodies just are huge. It's a huge change with, with this class. That's probably the, my greatest, the greatest gift for me and one of my big targets is to have people increase their awareness of what's possible with bodies. And, see, and just see bodies as something, they're not just these physical things that we live with, but they're actually creative energy that, create, that, that we can create our lives with and they can contribute to us so you start to see the contribution in your body actually yeah yeah and there's so much more um there's so much more joy and happiness oh yeah we're having a bit of a zoom glitch here there can you hear me um there's so much more, if we include the body, you know, as a mental health practitioner, what I can say is when we include the body and even when we work non-verbally, just even with the body, um, how much change can occur? How much more joy and happiness can actually become available to us um, when we reconnect, you know, from when we've been separate from our bodies and we reconnect and we, like you said, like even let the body lead the way, there's some really, really miraculous and amazing healing that can happen. So yeah. um, I'm just so grateful that we've been able to have this conversation today and, and just show people that there's this different possibility available for healing um, with bodies and all. And um, you know, for those of us um, who want to find out more, Glenna, if you can still hear me, I know we're having some Zoom connection issues. Um, how can people Sorry find? About that. Yeah, no worries. It's technology. How can people find out more about you, about classes, um, if they want to do individual sessions with you, if they're local here in the area, and I know you travel the world also, where can they find you? Um, DrGlennaRice.com. 
And you can also go to accessconsciousness.com slash Dr. Glenna Rice to find my classes quick, but it's all on my website too. So that's the easiest way to find me. And I'm, I'm in, I'm north of San Francisco. So if you're in the Bay area, you can get private sessions in person. And I also do zoom sessions. We can change a lot of things over the phone, which the pandemic showed us. <laughs> yeah. <the laughs> what was possible amazing times of that. Yes. Thank you yeah. so much for being my guest today. And thank you all for tuning in. Um, if you like this episode, please do click like, comment, share. Let's get this information out there in the hands of more people so they can know that there are many, many other ways to address mental health, bodies, and, and everything else to create a greater possibility. Thank you, Glenna. Thank you for having me on. This was wonderful. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Kaleidoscope of Possibilities, Alternative Perspectives on Mental Health. This has been Dr. Adriana Popescu. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe and share with others. To find out more about me, my guests, and more, please visit my website at adrianapopescu.org. See you next time.